Hello, everyone. It's uh, it's Friday, and welcome to How I Built This Resilience Edition. It's great to have you with us. Um, this is where we're hearing from entrepreneurs and business leaders about ways that they are building resilience into their businesses. Um, in the window next to me is Taha Bawa. He's the co-founder of Goodwall. It's a social network for, for Gen Z, primarily for Gen Z, um, that helps connect students and, and college graduates with jobs and scholarships and, and other opportunities, which we'll talk about. Um, Goodwall has raised over $16 million from investors. It now has more than a million users. Taha, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and if you're Great watching you. via Facebook or YouTube or Twitter, we are taking your questions for Taha. Um, a lot to talk about because we are entering a very challenging um, economy. And this will be potentially um, a tough time for, for people graduating college. Um, hopefully not. So we're going to talk about some of those challenges and, and, and ways to build resilience. So Taha, first of all, um, where are you and how are you, how are you doing? Um, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm doing well. I'm in Geneva right now in Switzerland. So I was supposed to be in um, not very far from where you are right now, but then COVID happened and travel stopped and I'm, I'm back in Switzerland right now. And you're based in Geneva. Your, your main headquarters are in Geneva, right? Yeah, we're a remote company. So I wouldn't say there's a there's a really a main headquarters because we're really distributed, but I'm back in Switzerland now and that's where I'm at. Right. Right. Um, all right. So, so for for people who've never heard of Goodwall, tell, just kind of tell us how how does it work? It's essentially a mobile first platform that's designed for the next generation. We started off with high school students, helping them build up their first profile, showcase themselves in a way that um, accentuates their extracurricular activities in particular, connect them to opportunities, mostly scholarships and colleges, and then all of this happens within a positive and supportive community. And over time, we've grown with our members into the college and young professional space. And specifically over the past months, we've um, put a lot of emphasis on, on a part of our business, which is really around challenges. Um, so helping youth develop you know, design thinking and work experience online virtually um, that works as work experience going forward. And today we serve, as you, as you said, members from around the world. And our whole goal is to level the playing field and maximize the potential of as many people as possible. So it's been compared to LinkedIn. Is that a fair comparison? I think there are similarities. Um, however, we're really focused on on our on our part, which is this next generation starting as early as sixteen and guiding them through, almost sherpaing them through the future of earning and learning and those opportunities. I think there there are various features that we have that they don't, and we're really focused from a user experience perspective on that and then from a from a community perspective it's it's very different uh posts that you would see on linkedin just don't work here you wouldn't find you know students talking about being on the the chess team being on the robotics team being on etc right. etc et on goodwall so so basically it's like um i mean if you are let's say 18 years old and you're interested in applying to college um what does it look like you go to goodwall you create a, a profile for yourself and and then what yeah, you go onto Goodwall, you create a profile for yourself. For, for, a lot, for a lot of students around the world, initially, our initial early adopters were mostly international school students who maybe didn't have as much guidance as others, or domestic students, for example, um, students based out of the US who maybe didn't have as much guidance from their parents or from college counselors. They'd come on here, see what other people are doing. They would see, they would be matched with colleges and universities and also with scholarships based on their data and their profiles. And then they'd be able to connect with like-minded um, youth. So uh, pretty like an incredible example we have is for example, we had this girl based out of Jordan who um, was really into robotics and science. And unfortunately there's no one really around her who had that, those similar interests. And she was able to find others like her in the US connected, interned at NASA, did incredible things afterwards actually um, many of our students have gone and found exclusive opportunities at universities like Oxford and others that we've partnered with for, um, or through Goodwall rather. And wow. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's super fulfilling from that perspective. So the idea essentially, and, and you partner with universities and programs that offer scholarships, the idea is essentially to connect scholarship opportunities, university opportunities, and even post post-college job opportunities with this younger demographic. Yeah, in terms of opportunities, we have um, opportunities for high school students, which tend to be 
which tended to be scholarships and college opportunities. Now we're adding vocational programs as well, especially with the way the world is going and the way higher education is going. We're firm believers in, in vocational learning, so apprenticeships and the rest. And then as they're getting older, um, internships, first jobs, and what I called something we're doing right now, specifically where supply and demand are just not met. So there's so much more supply in terms of youth um, employment requests and just not enough job opportunities. So what we've done is we've put together a program, what we call Better Together, where it's on Goodwall, but we've brought together some of the leading UN organizations, some of the leading education organizations like Pearson, some of the leading recruitment organizations like Monster, and some of the leading corporates, Santander and others that have come together to provide work experience and opportunities for youth to develop well skills, but also build up some hope and, and be recognized for it that they can then follow on with educational opportunities, scholarships after having done this program, be recognized for it when the jobs start to come back and who knows, maybe even receive funding because there's a piece of this which is really to drive entrepreneurial thinking and resilience um, through yeah. this program and through these programs. And so who knows, maybe we'll have some great companies come out of this. Yeah, it's really cool. I was, I was checking it out um, last night and it's, it's like a little bit like if you didn't have a mentor or a guidance counselor, like, here you go. Yeah, definitely. I think um, we started off with a lot of our early adopters were, were very, were privileged in the sense that they had a lot of ambition and maybe they went to good schools. But over time, we've, especially over the last year, we've really put a lot of effort and a lot of energy towards going after and helping youth who are maybe a little underprivileged. And that privilege is actually not necessarily 100% linked to um, financial situation, but it can be. For example, what we're doing now with UNICEF and other organizations in Africa, for example, is we're running programs there and we're really helping youth bring out their ideas, build up their confidence, show who they are and connect to opportunities. And it's been really, really fulfilling and we expect to do more um, underrepresented communities in the US, for example, we're doing more and more there. And that's where the biggest room for impact is. At the end of the day, we are yeah. a social enterprise and it's very fulfilling to help, of course, um, youth who, who go to elite schools and connect them to elite universities and colleges, but it's even more fulfilling and even more important for us to step in where the, let's say the impact delta is the biggest, for, for example, youth in Africa who in certain African countries that just don't have any exposure, don't have opportunity, don't have, um, don't have that guidance, but do have access uh, to a phone and yeah. um, can as a result go through it. So we're really trying to do more there in particular. So it's mobile first. I know that, um, and by the way, we're, we're collecting your questions. So please keep them coming for Taha um, through, via Facebook or Twitter or YouTube. Um, I know you started this company in 2014 with your brother. Um, where did the idea come from? Yeah, so my it was my brother's idea. Uh, we we started off, so I was born in Switzerland, or my both of us were born in Switzerland. We lived in Pakistan, Iran, the US, came back to Switzerland. Our parents used to work in the humanitarian sector. So my father worked for or served refugees for around 30 years. And we experienced a lot growing up. We, it was like quite a contradiction going skiing on the weekend in a, in a very affluent or privileged um, little bubble in Switzerland. Whereas at the same time, we'd go on summer vacation and and give candy out to refugee kids who were our age, um, you know, 10, 11. Yeah. And that, that, that really did shake us quite a bit. And throughout our upbringing, we realized that we are where we are. I'm here, not because I'm smart, but because I was lucky. I was born, I could have been born two doors down and that my life would have been very different. And I'm confident because of the experiences, I'm able to speak to you with relative confidence because of the experiences I had rather than because I'm um, innately able to do so. And that's really what pushed us to say, you know, we were lucky in this sense. What would happen if we were able to give those opportunities in terms of particularly experiences? So education is one thing, or traditional education is one thing, but particularly experiences to millions of youth around the world. What would happen? And how could we, how could we change things? And that's where we thought, okay, it has to be mobile first, or it has to be a digital solution, and it has yeah. to be able to tackle millions. And we wanted to go a step further. We said it's good to maximize one's potential, but hopefully we can do that in a way, and we're very idealistic in that sense, um, in a way that it maximizes or improves society as well, or impacts society positively, which is our mission statement. That if we have enough people that are exposed to not only improving themselves, but there's so often it's a form of education, knowing what's out there. If I hadn't gone to those refugee camps, or if I didn't have the background where my parents are originally from Sri Lanka, would I really be so inclined to have this positive impact? Who knows? But, but I did have that chance and I view that as an opportunity. So if we can give those opportunities and showcase through volunteering, through being aware, through 
you know, connecting to people from different backgrounds. Um, you know, hopefully we can move the world forward. I think it's needed now more than ever, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, Ty, let's talk, let's talk business for a second. Um, I think, I think you've got around 50 employees, um, around the world. You've got offices in, in, in like, uh, obviously Switzerland, the U S Germany, Serbia, the Philippines. Um, so, I mean, you're growing, you've got presumably some cash runway, um, but these are tough economic times. I mean, LinkedIn just laid off a thousand people. There, there are record numbers of people in the U.S. filing for unemployment. So first of all, how, how has your revenue been in your business been impacted by the, by the global you know, economic slowdown? Yeah, I mean, when it happened, I think the first week where we started to notice it was getting really serious. I remember it. The first thing we did was we, we had a board meeting and we talked about, okay, what's our cash, cash situation and let's make sure we get through this, however long that may be. And luckily we were able, we're in a privileged situation where we have um, you know, with, with re-forecast, re-forecasting and assuming that certain parts of our business would go off a cliff, uh, which is what it felt like at the time, that we'd have yeah. the runway to be able to, to survive this, whether it be two years or two and a half years or whatever that may be. And we were able to do that. And once we realized we were able to do that, while maintaining the, the team, because we said we, we really need for two reasons. One is like, you don't want to be on that de- downward, deathward, deathward, death spiral, but also yeah. because we have, you know, the opportunity to have real impact in this, in this, in this time, if we make the changes and adapt effectively, but we won't be able to do so if we don't have the team to do it. So we've actually hired over the past few months and we've actually grown over the past few months yeah. um, and we've adapted to do so. But the first week was really about scenario planning and getting through that. After that, um, yeah. we, we, we assumed the worst, but we ourselves decided, well, there's, there's definitely, and we saw the metrics come in, where there's definitely gonna be less demand for recruitment. There's definitely less hires, which, is, which, is, which hurts us, which hurts our users or our, our members. Yeah. And we said, okay, how can we, how can we change? How can we change? How can we help start, starting off with that? What can we do? Because if they come on and they're no jobs, well, it's a, it's a very bad experience, but it's also, it's hurting us. So what we did was we put up, we put together this program, as I mentioned, Better Together and other challenges where youth can really develop work experience, which is acting as that internship, if I can say, um, or mm-hmm. that, that, that internship. They get that work experience. They go through these design thinking challenges. They participate. And this has allowed us to drive value to our members while there are not enough jobs. But at the same time, sorry, sorry, Raz, you're going to say something. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm just, can, what do you, I mean, they can actually do an internship through the site? Like, how does that work? So it's more like work experience rather than an internship or formal internship with a company. It's a program that one participates in. You know, they've been various COVID challenges and the rest of them. At the end right. of it, they get certificates that show that they've accomplished these different challenges, participated in it, received feedback. Um, and at the end, it can be used as work experience towards all of our partner companies that we're working with. Right. So it's actually giving them something to do, some hope. And at the same time, this is generating revenue for us. This is one example of generating revenue for us. Another, uh, another, sorry, another example is, um, you know, just before the crisis, uh, part of our model is we work with large partners to distribute and to, 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 to grow. And right. a couple of these large partnerships, so, you know, like leading recruitment and leading education groups stopped yeah. or came to a halt. Right. Right. And um, this is like needs signature at the C level, Fortune 500 companies, and it stops. And we're like, okay. And then I think, I don't know if this is despite COVID or because of COVID, other opportunities came about. And um, we've now partnered over the, over the course of COVID with market leaders in markets that we are not present in or we're huh. very marginally present in. And it's actually allowing us to take up extra market share and grow in a more significant way September onwards. So that's been really exciting. So partnerships that allow us to grow that we would have normally taken a long time to, to, to execute on have just accelerated. Yeah. And even the Better Together program, we've brought together organizations that would normally take you know, years to come together. And they came together over the course of four weeks, you know, like UN organizations, leading NGOs, um, governments, corporates, educational providers, universities and colleges, like coming together so quickly. And some of these organizations we've been talking to for you know, months. And yeah. then all of a sudden it's like, listen, we need to react. And there's this collective goodwill and willingness to do something. But it also makes financial sense for all of them. And we're all in the same boat that we need to think out of the box and be creative to be able to move forward. And the same goes with some of the partnerships. Let, let me ask you about um, 
the demographic that you that you target, right? I mean, um, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna use this term Gen Z, which I always cringe when I say it because I remember like when I was in my 20s and people talked about Gen X and their slackers, and I would just cringe and just hear older people talk about Gen Xers, and I was like, what are you talking about? But just just to make this kind of simple, we'll, we'll just say Gen Z. So if you're a Gen Z, I'm sorry, it's annoying, I know. <laughs> um, this is a challenging, really challenging economic moment. Um, if you are you know, in high school now and you're going into college, or if you're in college or you're, you know, you're, you're gonna graduate in the next few years, there's a pretty good chance you're gonna graduate into a, into a, a world with very few jobs. Um, you know, a, a world that we haven't seen certainly since 2008, not nine and 10, but maybe far, far more challenging than that. Um, what What's your sense? I mean, what do you think? I mean, do, do you think that's that's actually true? That That is likely to be the case for the next three, four, five years or more? Yeah, I think there are various parts to that. Uh, whether or not we go through a deep recession with mass unemployment, particularly for the youth over the next three, four, five years, I really don't know. There, there are definitely indications to, to show that there is a possibility or definitely an increased possibility compared to before. But I've been saying for a long time, and a lot of people have been saying for a long time, that we're entering into a, a time, and I feel like COVID or, or this crisis has just exasperated that, um, where industries are being created and destroyed over the course of a few years. Look at airlines, and we just talked just before about you know startups in, 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 in air travel, where super great one day and then completely dead the next. And this is this is likely to happen not just over the next five years, but over the next 20 or the, the foreseeable future with automation, um, AI, various changes in, in competition. And so um, I think this has just accentuated that. And so it's possible that uh, youth, and it's very probable that youth, at least in the short run, are to suffer. They're normally the last to be hired, the first to be fired. And that's justified for various reasons, um, including ethical to be like, oh, they have less commitments than, for example, someone with a few kids. Um, but it is incre incredibly difficult. And the mental toil of, let's say, an 18 year old who doesn't know what's coming up next. Um, yeah. Maybe they didn't even know it before the crisis because, you know, there's all this talk about is this career even going to exist in a few years? And this right. just really doubles down or, or on, on one one. I wouldn't say certainty because it's very hard to talk in certainties, but one element which is we need to be able to be resilient and we need to be able to learn how to learn and adapt because we just don't know what's going to happen so there could be a second downturn there could be a third downturn there could be sustained downturns and us like across society but in particular for the youth they we have an opportunity they have an opportunity to take this and say okay it doesn't kill me it might make me stronger and i can learn from this and develop that resilience that you know yeah five, six, 10 years from now, I'm able to deal with the next crisis in a more, um, in a stronger way, because I'm going to have to do that. And some of the skills that need to be developed in my, in my opinion are entrepreneurial thinking, that ability to be flexible and resilient. And we're being forced to, it's almost like, um, you know, learning by fire or, 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 yeah. or being dumped in the deep end for a young person today. So um, yeah, yeah. We, we need to do more though. You know, we're, we're leaving, beyond just the, the, these massive stimulus packages and you know, the government is trying to do whatever they can, for sure this generation needs, the government needs to intervene to be able to, or organizations need to be able to intervene to support them to the best of their abilities in terms of developing these skills and being able to, to be resilient. Yeah, I, I'm curious, I mean, like in terms of like an in, in individual right now, right? So when I was 22 and I, I started out as a journalist, no one took me seriously because that's just the way it works. You're 22 and people don't take you seriously and they don't trust you with anything. And I wanted to be on the radio and nobody would let me be on the radio because they didn't, I had no track record. And, and, and so there was a period of three, four years before I was able to kind of gain the trust of older gatekeepers to get on the radio. And, and I think that's the same in any profession that you come in, you're 22, 23, and the older people that don't trust you, which is terrible, but that's just how it's been. But there's a transition period and you kind of work through it and then you kind of break through in your late 20s. If you're 20, if you're like in your early 20s now and you're looking for an opportunity and you can't find one, what, I mean, what, what, what would you recommend a young person do who's, who's graduating college or is just entering the workforce and is kind of 
trying out different potential career paths? I mean, is it a good time to just steer clear of the workforce for a while and get some more education, which in the U.S. means more debt? What do you think? Yeah, I, I think definitely trying is, is important, but this might just be an opportunity to start your own thing. Uh, you know, a lot of great companies came out of the last crisis because they just couldn't find jobs or that opportunity just wasn't there for a year. So maybe start one's own thing. It's never been easier to start a business. It's never been easier to try something new. So worst case, even if it doesn't, if, even if it doesn't work, that's incredible work experience. You know, when we talk yeah. to CHROs of some of the leading companies in the world, what are they looking for? Or what were they looking for before the crisis and definitely after is that ability to be entrepreneurial, even if you're working for a Fortune 500. Yeah. So it can't hurt. Best case scenario, you build something amazing. Worst case scenario, you fail and you take those skills and you leverage those skills and you keep your mind active. It's so important from a mental health perspective. Keep your mind active and then apply them when the market comes back, which it will at one point. Another, another um, opportunity, if, if maybe starting yourself isn't it, join some friends or join or reach out to small startups. Definitely volunteer is an opportunity. Um, there, there are a lot of NGOs, there are a lot of nonprofits that need help or need support right now. Build up your work experience, gain some experience, like concrete, tangible work experience that differentiates you further, rather than just having eight, 12 months in your resume, which are empty, incredibly toiling or tolling on yourself. Um, but you're doing something, you're building up experience. Unfortunately, it might not help on the financial side. And that's where um, that's where one has to be creative. And it's, it's just really tough. And that's where you know, what is a government intervention on that front uh, need to be? Because there's some that just can't afford to to do what I just said, which is volunteer or build your own company because they don't have that safety net. They don't have that opportunity. And, and unfortunately, there, you know, we're almost out of ideas because, okay, you go back to college, you just talked about um, debt, extra debt. Um, but for some, unfortunately, they're going to have to do it. And that leads to a more, you know, a more philosophical discussion on, on why is there so much debt attached to um, a college education where, you know, in Switzerland, for example, I paid um, for my undergraduate, I paid around thousand uh, dollars a year. It's a leading education. Wow. I mean, it's like a yeah. you know, yeah. one of the top universities. And so, you know, that's a, that's another discussion. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I agree with you. I think that this is a moment to be entrepreneurial. Um, and it's, it's challenging because you're, you're right. I mean, not everybody, um, you know, can do that. I mean, and, and there was a time not too long ago where you could, you could wait tables. And now of course, you know, the restaurant industry, certainly in the U S is in crisis. So, um, there are a lot of challenges moving forward. I want to I want to ask you about, like, from an employer's perspective. You mentioned human resource officers, and by the way, you're right. I mean, a human resource officer is very attracted to a, an applicant who started a business or tried to start up and it, it failed. You know, it's because, as you say, that's incredible life and work experience. But from the perspective of a hiring. A hiring manager or or business looking for this next generation of employees. I mean, what are and I, again, I, I I struggle with with these generalities because every generation essentially is basically the same. That's just what I've realized in life. But what what are some of the characteristics and and sort of ways that quote unquote Gen Z works that are, might be different from previous generations? Maybe w their expectations, for example. Yeah, it's something that comes up quite often. You know, the expectations are, are huge. I think even if we look at the generation before, part of it is, um, well, there, there's, one can see, so there's this is Instagramization. So it looks amazing. You have these, you know, self coaches or these self help coaches that talk about how amazing they are and how they made, you know, I go into TikTok and they made millions of dollars by the age of whatever. And what do they actually do? And it's, it turns out to be, you know, lies or a scam. And one can think, you know, even the most basic Instagram post of showing, you know, I don't know if you've seen where they, they take a photo of the beach and there's a thousand people, but they get the right angle. That's a lie, right? And it shows this kind of, this life. And it's, it's you know, that mixed with this, the social networks in general that have been prevalent over the past years, it's almost this instant gratification that is needed. And yeah. um, without the, the, the other side, which says, actually life is really hard and it's always been really hard and it's probably easier now than it was before. At least that's what the data shows um, in some conditions, in some cases for some people. Um, and then you add to the fact that um, colleges and schools, even before that, talk students up and have been talking students up to say, it's kind of their justification. Why are you spending so much money with me? 
oh, you're spending so much money because you're amazing. You're doing such a great job. And when you come out, you're going to change, blah, 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 blah. And it's, 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 it's again, it's, a, it's not necessarily the truth. There, there needs to be, and there always has been this need for grit, for determination. And um, I think, I think post-COVID, uh, we're going to have very likely an incredibly resilient and determined generation. I think yeah. it's it's really great for. I mean, it's great. It's very tough. A lot are going to suffer, and I, I hope um, you know. I, I hope it'll be as as few as possible. But coming out of this, generally on the whole, there's 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 good reason to believe that this generation is going to be really conscious, a bit like after World War II, um, really conscious of uh, financials, very conscious of how lucky they are, how privileged, how quickly things can change, how precarious the society within which we live is. Actually, you know, it's it's. It's a disease that, yes, it's 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 serious, but it could have been a lot worse. It could have been 10x worse. It could have been 100x worse. And it's brought yeah. our global economy to its knees. And you know, we feel like we're often the masters of the universe. And that's not just Gen Z, but across demographics. And we clearly aren't. Um, and I think a little bit of humility goes a long way. You know, it's really interesting in the in the news business to and and I mean, I love the energy of younger people coming in because their ideas are just so radically different from the way people in my business have have seen their profession. Um, what what is your advice for employers looking to harness the the? In, let me ask you that question again. Um, what like what is the what is what is your advice for employers looking to harness the intellectual power of Gen Z as part of their workforce? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. And again, we're we're speaking massive generalizations i think it's it it they're basics of management that are that have been the same for every demographic and every every um every niche within that demographic it's look at maximizing the potential of the particular individual right so different people react differently to different forms of management some people you know within this we can talk about trends but the ability to give them that chance to express themselves the ability to trust the, the need for trust is it's always been there now, definitely so. I mean, even more so because they 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 know what they're capable of. They're very they might have that confidence to believe in it. But then also, must not forget, they are still with very few years of experience. And being able to be there to give feedback, to to tell them what they're doing right, tell them what they're doing wrong, um, both both sides is critical. So just leaving someone out there um, in the wilderness is not going to necessarily. Uh, lead to great results either. But giving that safe space, giving that trust and creating an environment of being, okay, I'm here to maximize your potential. And the order, the direct order may have worked or they may have been able to get away with it in the past. But you know, there's some people that might still be okay with it. But generally speaking, that's that's especially for, for youth with a lot of potential, that's just not conducive for maximizing their potential. Where do you um, where do you see your your business and what you're doing? in five years from now what do you what do you what do you want it to look like yeah i think for us it's always been about really helping as many youth as possible be as inclusive as we can and so um, we're already serving youth in 150 countries we'd like to go deeper in certain areas through our partnerships or alone um, serve more youth in a more significant way provide more opportunities just really the best experience um, that's probably what's most important i think that's where we can have where we can make our contribution towards society. That's what we're good at. And now it's just about going to that next level. Um, we've got great backers. We've got, yes, it's a challenging period, but we're going to be okay. We're going to get out of this. And then it's about, okay, really taking this opportunity and doing the best we can because we are in a privileged situation. If we were, if we were unlucky, um, which has been the case for many other startups, you know, I've, I have friends who had term sheets for massive rounds of financing just evaporate and we hear the stories and then yeah. you know, they're just unlucky. So we're in this lucky position to be able to operate and to be able to do what we're doing. Let's make the most out of it. And I think that's our, that's kind of our duty. And I think that's, yeah. Tahabawa, co-founder of Goodwall. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you. Uh, before we go, I just want to say hello to a few people. Sorry, sorry, I couldn't get to your question. Claire Murashima. Hello, Claire. Nitin Kana. Uh, Derek Mukisa uh, Krap in Uganda. Kwame uh, in the US. Uh, Dante Richardson. Hello, Dante in LA. Tushar Desai. Hello, Tushar in New Jersey. Um, a couple of quick announcements before you go. Um, this Monday, we've got a brand new episode coming out um, 
it's the story of the laundress, which is this amazing story of a company that makes non-toxic laundry and home cleaning products started by uh, Lindsay Boyd. Um, it, they grinded for like five, six years and maxed out credit cards and almost like went bust several times until they were eventually bought for an insane amount of money. Um, listen to that episode. So cool. Um, next week, we are back with uh, the Resilience Edition right here online. Um, you can join us next Tuesday. I've got Sarah Harden and Lauren Neustadter. Um, they are uh, a production team. The company is called Hello Sunshine. It was founded by Reese Witherspoon. They'll talk about the movie and, and TV industry and the you know how production has basically been on hold. Next Friday, same time right here, 12 noon Eastern, I will be talking to the founder of Zumba, Alberto Perlman. He was on How I Built This a few years ago. Bring your headbands and your sweatpants because we're going to do some Zumba. I think I'm going to try in my little studio here. Uh, so check that out. It's going to be super fun. Um, and um, I will see you back here uh, next Tuesday. So thank you for joining us. Um, Tyler, Tyler, thank you so much again. And um, hope, hope, hope we get a chance to meet in person one of these days. Thank you so much, Guy. Really nice to meet you. Have a great end of the week. Thank and you. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.